Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I know there are still people who are in the process of joining us, but I think we'll get started anyway, and then they can join over the next few minutes whilst we're doing the introductions. Um, welcome this afternoon to this webinar in association with Rapid and Seamless Asia, where we'll be taking a look at growing your online marketplace. I think certainly a very topical discussion given the events that we've all been experiencing this year. Uh, my name is Paul Clark. I'm the general manager here at Terrapin, but really you're going to hear very little from me today because I've got five experts lined up for you who all know far more about the topic we're going to be discussing about, and they're going to be leading you through this discussion. Um, just before we get started, a couple of very quick housekeeping comments from me. Um, first of all, the opinions expressed by our panelists during this webinar this afternoon are theirs and do not necessarily represent their organizations. And the second thing is that we really want to make this as interactive a session as possible. And really what that means is that we want to hear from you. So if you'd like to ask a question of our panelists, it really is very easy. Um, all you need to do is click on the Q&A button, which you will find towards the bottom of your screen, I believe. Um, it very helpfully is labeled Q&A and has an icon that looks like two speech bubbles talking to each other. If you pop your question in there, um, then the panelists will be able to see it and we will answer as many of them as we can during the session, time permitting. Um, all that really remains for me to do now is to hand over to our moderator for this afternoon's session. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Saurabh Singh from McKinsey. And Saurabh, I'll let you introduce yourself and then kick things off. Thank you uh, so much, Paul. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. Uh, my name is Saurabh. Uh, I'm an associate partner with McKinsey & Company. Uh, I live in Myanmar uh, and do most of my work uh, in uh, e-commerce, uh, mainly in new business development, which, as Paul said, is, uh, uh, is uh, really the hot topic these days. And I think it's uh, the topic for today, which is just building an online marketplace, is uh, perhaps um, one that uh, I've uh, focused on the entire of this year and so many of my conversations. And if we leave aside COVID and vaccine and everything else, uh, it's perhaps one of the positive um, uh, areas of development that 2020 has given us. Um, I'll start with this uh, one page, which uh, some of you might have seen before. Uh, it's a chart that shows e-commerce penetration in the US. Um, and the best, the message uh, that it says, and which is one of the reasons why it's become very popular this year is uh, the penetration in the US grew as much, if not a little bit more in the first 10 weeks of this year than it had in the previous 10 years. Really goes to show uh, just the, the fundamental uh, disruption that COVID has been and in the way it has changed the way people buy things um, uh, previously in physical, now uh, online being a big part of that. That, however, is too simplistic. And I think this next chart perhaps tells the picture as uh, it is. It's a meme. Some of you will have probably seen it online. Uh, what most people think uh, is a straight line in reality is much more uh, complicated. Uh, I, for one, have, uh, I think, worked harder this year than I have ever in my life before. And I believe that holds true for many of you as well. And that is really what is reflected, what you see on the right-hand side. And that is what we want to talk about today. Uh, which is as e-commerce has been lifted by COVID and marketplaces are coming up, um, what are those um, uh, trends in supply and demand that most people don't see? And what's really happening under the surface and how can we, as we grow, um, uh, or at least we do our part in, this, in the growth of this sector, how can we be aware of that? Um, so, um, today's uh, panel, uh, I've got four people, um, all distinguished in their uh, fields uh, with me. Uh, on the left, though, let's start with the agenda. Uh, we'll finish the opening now, and we'll do uh, quick introductions. Um, after that, we'll do the panel discussion. If you have questions, uh, Paul mentioned, uh, put them in the Q&A. Uh, the chart says uh, chat box, pick whatever you think is better. Q&A is better because that's what Paul said. But if you do type something in chat, we'll try and pick it up as well. Uh, feel free to ask uh, any question as long as it's respectful, of course. Let's make this an open and a fun discussion. Um, and with that, um, I'll ask the panelists uh, one by one to introduce uh, themselves. I'll call upon them. And as uh, folks, as you do, uh, please, if you could answer two questions. Number one, just about yourself, uh, what you uh, are working in. Uh, and number two, 
uh, if you could talk about one thing um, that most people don't realize uh, relating to e-commerce growth, which is in this mess on the right-hand side of this, or something that was a surprise uh, to you this year, uh, that would be helpful. Uh, so uh, let's get started, uh, Tegar. Cool, thanks a lot, Sarah. Uh, it's really great to be here. So hi guys, my name is Tegar. So I help run Marketplace in Gojek. Essentially, it's a team that balances supply and demand dynamic uh, for maximum growth opportunities. So Marketplace team in Gojek manages pricing, the matchmaking engine that connects the driver and the customer, as well as like the demand incentive and supply incentive uh, for the purpose of balancing the marketplace. So one thing that I think I was struck by uh, this year was actually gold investment. So uh, I think it is in relation to uh, the chart that you showed earlier, where like the penetration has just like uh, gone really up this year. Uh, this also has a spillover effect to investment. So in Indonesia, uh, usually during like uh, tough times, people would try to hoard cash and uh, trying to like stay away from like the stocks or the bond investment. Uh, but what we really saw this year is uh, we are partnering with a fintech company in Indonesia called Kluang. And for the first time ever in Indonesia, they managed to make gold uh, to be an exchange market. And like uh, since earlier this year, we've just been seeing a dramatic growth in gold investment. So I'm really seeing that this trend would, has been completely transformed by the pandemic. And I think it's a really good momentum for like alternative investment or like uh, investment in general uh, to start picking up and be online. Thank you, um, Joel. Hey, uh, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, Sarab, thanks for, for moderating. Uh, my name is Joel Yarbrough. I manage Asia Pacific for Rapid. Uh, our goal and my goal is really to take this incredible diversity that we're seeing in localized payments everywhere around the world and certainly around Asia uh, and make it simple. I make it simple for global companies to go hyper local in every market that they want to expand in around the world. Uh, and make it simple for local companies to grow outside their home market without having to become masters of payments in the next market that they go to. Uh, so that's really our goal is to get that simplicity uh, built in, uh, despite how uh, the exigencies of what it takes for people to grow. Uh, I think in the COVID year, uh, and hopefully it's just this year, not too much of next year, but we'll see. Uh, the thing that I've been most pleasantly surprised by uh, is actually the degree to which people have reached out to help each other. Uh, to try to be understanding, to give grace to some extent. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work in multiple different mission-driven companies uh, where people and really empowering people is at the core of what the companies are about. Uh, and it's great to see that ethos uh, happen in many, many places around the world. Uh, restaurants coming together uh, to lower prices and pool logistics, uh, simplify their business propositions and really do what it takes to have more businesses survive. Uh, and more people survive this uh, this very special time that we're all trapped in at the moment. Thank you. Um, Hardik? Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm Hardik. I'm the commercial director for Food Panda Philippines. Uh, Food Panda is owned by Delivery Hero Group, which is one of the leading food delivery groups operating in the world outside China. My role in uh, Food Panda Philippines concerns with the seller side of things, monetization strategy, bringing them on the platform, managing relationships. Um, some, 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 something peculiar about COVID because I think startup showed a very rosy picture. It, it wasn't that great in, in a lot of markets. Um, a lot of markets uh, went through really the stress test of their operations. The sellers were not just ready to sell online. Restaurants had to shut. Uh, consumer confidence was at an all-time low, in, especially in countries like uh, in, in South Asia, especially India and, and Pakistan. Um, so yeah, dif different countries had different trajectories and, and different consumer sentiment. So looking forward to speak with all of you and share some thoughts on the same lines. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Hardik. Uh, Kanan. All right. Uh, thanks, Sarab. Thanks, everyone, for having me. So my name is Kanan. I lead the uh, ops and strategy um, initiatives for payments and uh, 
customer operations for the Zalora group. So uh, taking a step back and looking into where it all transpired, right? So in Southeast Asia, especially um, COVID started to have much stronger impacts late in mid of March to late March. And then the trajectories uh, took off from there. Uh, one of the, not so surprising, but more of like something that is anticipatory, but yet uh, the, the velocity wasn't as expected. Um, more and more new customers were acquired. So beyond looking into the data, I also had like to have conversations with customers to see uh, the smaller data or rather the insights uh, where we can actually use them to improve our customer's journey. So they said like, one of the two big things they look forward in e-commerce is costs and convenience. And uh, that which somehow was available in the offline retail was slowly fading away. To a certain extent, if you go to a mall now, you need to scan, you need to queue, and then go into the items. You can't try on some of the clothes. When it comes to shopping online and they find it a bit more convenient these days. To, to my surprise, I've spoken to some of the people who actually told me like a year ago that I will never shop online, or especially when it comes to my clothes. But today they are shopping online. So it's, it's a blessing in disguise, uh, but yet uh, to a certain extent, uh, we are keeping in mind the struggles that it actually brought to the people in general. Thank you, um, Kanan. Uh, so thanks uh, folks uh, also for um, your introductions. Um, indeed, it is uh, uh, not all uh, rosy. Uh, it is, it's, it's more complicated uh, than that. Uh, and indeed, it is, it's a combination of demand and supply. Demand has picked up, as Kanan, you mentioned, people who uh, were not now are online. The challenge really is supply. Can you supply them uh, in a cost-effective and a convenient way? Uh, so with that in mind, maybe I'll start the first question, which is about demand. Uh, and I'll, Joel, Joel, I'll put this question uh, to you, uh, given your role um, as uh, being just having an overview of the whole region. Uh, if you think of e-commerce, Indonesia is the largest market. Uh, and in some ways, it's also um, concentrated the whole e-commerce sector geographically in Indonesia and Malaysia. A few countries which are which have the lion's share, I think Thailand, Vietnam um, uh, as well. Uh, there, um, and Philippines. These are the five, they're about 90% share. Um, whereas the retail market size is a little bit more even. Um, so something has held the other countries back from growing as much as these has. Of course, these are the large economies. But just your views, given the disruption this year, looking forward, where geographically do you see the hotspots uh, of demand in the region? Yeah, I think the I think you're right. I mean, we see hotspots of demand consistent with the uh, bit of the distortion that you see today, right? So we did a payment study in April, uh, so still you know, during the virus, uh, and one of the things we looked at was people's self perceptions of being early adopters or late adopters of technology, uh, and Indonesia scores way over on the right hand side as being almost seventy percent of the population is digitally eager uh, or sees themselves as tech savvy in some way, which is, you know, for someone who's never been there, maybe a surprising view. Uh, but when you go, of course, you do see a very significant tech obsession and social media obsession, et cetera. Uh, so it's not a surprise that people are very engaged online uh, relative to some other markets that have you know, even more challenging bandwidth. Um, lower, you know, more difficulties getting you know, decent phones, things like that for some period of time. So I think you will see that trend happen for a while, uh, but we do see you know, huge volume spikes happening in the Philippines in certain categories and Vietnam in certain categories. Uh, so we do see it evening out because a lot of those bandwidth differences, a lot of the mobile uh, quality of mobile uh, connectivity differences have gone away. And of course people are stuck at home. So people who weren't inclined to trial or who were very focused on uh, touch and feel before they buy and buyer trust issues. Uh, to some degree, they have to set those aside and experiment in a way that maybe they didn't feel like they had to experiment before. So I think we are seeing that happen across the board. Uh, categories that are very digital are exploding, right? So digital goods, streaming media, gaming, et cetera, are off the charts growth. Uh, but even non-digital categories, we do see growing tremendously really across the region. So I think that leveling off between the online and offline, I think we can expect to see that six, seven months from now, look a lot more even uh, than before. Thank you. Um, so if you're talking about Indonesia, maybe uh, Tegar, if I may loop you in, uh, yours is a, uh, is a service that started in Indonesia. Would love to know 
when you expanded and you went to different markets in the region, what was your experience, Indonesia versus those other markets? What's the difference in the nature of demand there? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question, sir. Uh, I think uh, looking at more similar markets like Vietnam and Thailand, uh, definitely when we go into the market there, uh, whatever playbook that we have in Indonesia works really well in those markets. But obviously, it's uh, very different here in Singapore, for example. So I do continue that uh, largely because of the underlying economic structure of demographic and like a large middle class will continue to grow in these markets. And I think uh, not only for retailing or on-demand services, but also for like uh, e-commerce and uh, the uh, peripheral businesses. Uh, I do see that uh, even within Indonesia, like Jakarta alone contributes to 25% of national GDP. But when we look at our uh, business portfolio, Jakarta has contributed a lot more than that. So I do actually see a lot more opportunities in non-Jakarta regions uh, within Indonesia that are actually started to pick up really, really fast. So I do see that Indonesia will remain uh, one of like the biggest market uh, for foreseeable future. I see Vietnam uh, as a really close contender. Uh, and in fact, in some key segments, they're actually, uh, uh, in terms of growth rate, uh, running faster than uh, Indonesia. Thank you. Um, moving up, let's stay with demand for a bit and let's shift from geographical focus to category focus. Uh, along the year, um, you can see we've done a few surveys uh, to see where consumer sentiment sits. And along with this clear shift to online, we've also seen a shift to value where people reducing spending on uh, discretionary uh, and moving more towards essentials. So my next question is to Kanan, uh, given that your focus is on fashion, um, uh, which may or may not be discretionary depending on what you're buying, I guess. Uh, but would love to hear um, in, in your specific category vis-a-vis -vis others, what kind of uh, demand shifts have you seen? Right. So we totally understand being in fashion, right? So it's, it's a bit more discretionary and it's not really a, a need per se, but more of like a want. Uh, so what we did immediately when uh, we experienced that, okay, this is going to be the new norm, uh, we quickly switched the gear and we started offering a complementary service, uh, uh, and if I can put it in that way, where we have more essentials to complement our fashion categories. Um, in that sense, we, we noticed that there are mixed baskets coming through. Uh, more and more customers are shopping because then now it's a convenient in a single platform where your shipping and all that is consolidated. Uh, payment shipping is consolidated experience. So in that sense, um, Immediately after the lockdown in between Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia, I think within two or three weeks, we managed to sign uh, Nestle as our uh, new brand and also called Get Palm Leaf to start off with. And then um, then after we got um, a lot of other home essential uh, partners who came in. Uh, we have uh, SMEG, which is a, the premium uh, home appliances maker. We have Kin in Malaysia, which is also a well-known uh, home appliances uh, maker. Uh, so all this put together, I think uh, beyond that, within our core business, right, what we have actually noticed, there are strong shifts uh, from apparel to self-care uh, related products. So that, that is also a demand shift that we, we saw in, in, the, in the group. Got it. Um, thank you, uh, Kanan. And just staying on the on the theme of category, Hadik, uh, deliver, uh, the, the Delivery Hero company also has a focus on food, I believe. Um, so there as well, it's, it's a unique sector where essentially physical restaurants, um, that sector has been hurt very bad. Uh, people still have to eat, so they're ordering online. So we'd love to hear what um, uh, are the key shifts or changes uh, in demand that you've seen. Yeah, so, so you know, taking a cue from what you rightly pointed about the, the restaurant side of things, so across Food Panda, so Food Panda operates in close to 12 markets within APAC. And across all markets, we saw a steep decline, firstly, on the supply side, on the seller side. Close to 30% of the restaurants just vanished overnight who were not online anymore to, to sell food, right? So that was a big hit. But at least the restaurants who stayed, who were able to navigate through this crisis, they of course benefited a lot because the demand was there. The demand skyrocketed uh, around April and March. 
Um, some, 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 some trends which we saw across the board was that, as, as you mentioned, right, within food as well, we have some discretionary categories like desserts and bubble teas, the beverages in which people, we, we, we call it more indulgent categories. Those, of course, took a backseat, right? Mm. Uh, your meal volumes went up. There was also a huge demand for grocery and other essential deliveries. And we were quick to venture into that. Uh, we call it food panda shops or food panda, or, or we also have uh, our own inventory based business. We call it Panda Mart. Those volumes skyrocketed uh, people because, and, and at the end of the day, both of these are complementary. Either you're ordering food because you want to consume it or you're ordering groceries so that you can prepare your own food. And we saw the volume for both of these going up, right? Yeah. So overall, it was good. Um, the only fine balance we had to really maintain was if we are in a position to serve that demand in the right way. And when I say right, you, we, we mean a bit of, you know, to assure people of the security, the quality, uh, working hand in hand with the seller community to ensure that they stay online and help them navigate through the crisis. Uh, thank you. Uh, since we're on that topic, I think it's a good uh, time to pick up questions as they're coming. And there's a question from Fozia Amanula about Food Panda. That Food Panda has done a lot to help the community manage during the pandemic. Um, they have also benefited tremendously. How does Food Panda give back to those businesses? And if you see this as important, yeah, no, definitely it is. It is quite important, uh, and not just Food Panda. I think credits to all of e-commerce companies the shift has really been on value added services you are providing beyond just bringing them online sales. And we were quick to uh, again react. Um, during this lockdown, what had happened was that the capital was in crunch, right? Your, your dine out sales are not happening at a restaurant. And if you, if you look at a restaurant, typically online sales would not make up more than 20, 25% of the top line. And 75% was still dining in, people going and eating. When that took a hit, Right, a lot of restaurants give a feedback that um, there is a huge working capital crunch. So we mm -hmm. did two things. One, we worked around and ensured that the money remittance happens in a much expedited fashion, so that because Food Panda uh, basically collates the money and then pays it to the vendors, just like any other e-commerce platform, uh, we reduce that time. Uh, one more thing which we did was that we tied up with third parties. Uh, to provide easy capital access to a lot of these restaurants we are working with because we have a certain visibility on their volumes, on their potential. We thought if we can bridge the gap uh, of capital access, why not? So we did that. And there were a lot of, lot of things we did. We, we gave, because we wanted so many riders to come on board to cater to that demand, we gave uh, capital access to them as well. We made onboarding process really simpler Today, a restaurant can go live on Food Panda within two and a half days on an average, right? So, so those kind of things we did to give back to the community. Thank you. And the point on capital is actually quite important because as much as it is, you talk about restaurants or businesses that are facing working capital challenges, in some ways it's also true for customers who uh, could afford to buy a big electronic um, uh, a high price electronic uh, device uh, online, but um, now are more cost conscious. And in these times, um, I think uh, there's, there's been more and more discussion of credit. Uh, uh, services like Afterpay have really taken off uh, this year. So maybe my next question, uh, Joel, um, to you, uh, I'll pick up this question from Karun Arya. How important do you see credit or financing for both uh, consumers? Uh, through solutions like buy now, pay later, and um, for merchants and working capital in further developing an online uh, marketplace uh, where you have a huge influx of new users transacting for the first time. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're both extremely important. And I seen, think we've seen that not just in Asia, but around the world. You know, uh, PayPal purchased a company about 11 years ago called Bill Me Later. Uh, Klarna has been growing in Europe for quite some time. And then now we're seeing this tidal wave of buy now, pay later uh, in multiple Asian markets in Australia and New Zealand as well, uh, as well as then, and I'll address the, the business side as well. Uh, I think the, particularly for marketplaces, the most important role that consumer credit companies play isn't really credit as such. It's actually buyer protection. You know, a very large portion of customers that avail themselves of one of these services actually tend to pay off within two or three weeks. 
So the problem they're solving isn't affordability. It's actually having confidence in the seller, confidence in the goods. Uh, if you're in a place like the Philippines, confidence that the goods are going to reach you through the logistics process. And so the more the customer has that comfort level, and if one of these services can increase that comfort level, the more they're going to buy, right? So it's going to stick them to the marketplace. It's going to stick them to a retailer like Zalora. Uh, and ultimately, they'll be more engaged online shoppers, uh, regardless of the credit availability. Credit availability for you know, maybe 20% of the base is important so they can stretch out the payments. And then certainly from a COVID perspective and a job certainty perspective, we all intuitively think that matters a lot. Uh, but the durations are still relatively short in most cases, right? You're talking about paying off within two months or, or maximum three in most cases. Uh, on the working capital side, and I think Hardik already mentioned this, uh, there's a big spectrum, right? If you're an online marketplace seller uh, or a delivery rider or a restaurant, ultimately you're talking about getting paid as fast as humanly possible. Uh, and in a lot of cases, you're getting paid faster than the marketplace or faster than a payment platform like Rapid's actually getting settled too. So you're implicitly getting working capital from your partners that help you grow your business faster, pay your staff, pay your suppliers, et cetera. So it's extremely important uh, in, on the marginal initial payment. And then the more depth you have in that relationship, the more depth you have with that platform company, the better they can step in and say, look, I'm not just going to lend you, you know, three days worth of money quickly. I'm actually going to give you a month or two months worth of capital, which you can use to actually make improvements to your business and sell more, right? Or get more inventory and sell more and broaden your categories on, on Gojek. So I think they're both, um, both sides of that credit equation are extremely important to having engaged participants, whether buyers or sellers or suppliers. Uh, and ultimately sticking them uh, to the marketplace on the long term and reducing their churn. Uh, so it's a very important part to how ecosystems grow. And depending on the business that you're in, you might see a different mix uh, of what's going to work for you. Thanks, uh, Joel. And maybe a follow-up question. Uh, it's, it's come up in similar themes in a couple of areas. I'll combine it, which is... Um, if you're a marketplace, who do you look to partner with to provide that credit to your either merchants or your customers? You can either take the credit risk yourself, you can work with banks, you can work with digital payment companies. Um, what does that ecosystem look like and who's the best partner? Who you want to ask that question to? It's to you. Okay. Um, I think my, what I hear uh, is that if you start down the path of traditional banks, then and ultimately what you're not going to see is a tremendous amount of credit unlocked. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think there's a bigger opportunity for the platform to come in uh, and facilitate the credit themselves using, you know, they're frankly their own security uh, and lenders that are lending to them or investors that are lending to them, more of a mezzanine model. Uh, versus kind of turning around and trying to flip a you know, non-credit worthy restaurant to a bank that didn't want to lend to them in the real world. Uh, it's very unlikely that bank is going to turn around in a very short period of time and all of a sudden underwrite this, this restaurant without other platform sitting in the middle. Uh, so I think that's probably the most likely first place to start. Uh, in order to make that happen, you, know, you do need licenses in some cases. Uh, you do need partners who are willing to be to backstop your platform. Uh, I think that's where non-traditional lenders come in, uh, frankly, fan family offices, large investment pools, um, significant investors like the Mossack that have access to, to lending licenses through a number of their investment companies. So I think you're looking for a whole wave of non-traditional lenders that are still capable of lending in a legal and a compliant manner, but they're not themselves high street you know, lenders trying to lend to small business. Um, friends of mine that have been in that position have found their partners not able to move. Uh, versus people that have tried to build more of that value chain themselves with partners that are a little bit thinking differently have had a lot more success. Thank you. Uh, and keeping uh, on that topic of credit, Kanan, if I can come to you in your role as a regional director of payments, um, how have you seen uh, credit evolve this year and what are you doing in this space? Right. So I, I would I would relate this to both pull and push factor. Um, so on, on Zalora's end, we are also trying to move up the, the value chain by offering a uh, higher price point and luxury goods on our platform. With that, uh, the payment ecosystem that is readily available would not be able to support high value transaction. It may, may be able to complete the transaction, but beyond that, would it be able to stimulate purchase? Maybe not. For that reason, we truly realize that, you know, buy now, pay later is the option to go. 
So in, in how, how we model this is basically, um, we, we are still at the infancy stage. We will not be able to take up the, the risk on our own. So we work with partners trying to establish uh, the, the payment channel. So one of them is the, is the banks and then there, there are the digital payment uh, vendors. I think one of, the, one of the positive outlook from this is that the digital payment vendors collectively have more data to understand um, how the model works better in, in your demographic uh, or in your geography, for instance. So example, if they are serving 20 merchants, then the data is much more valuable in, in establishing predictive analysis and also doing KYC on onboarding new customers. So that's what we truly look forward. Um, we just launched a few weeks back, about two weeks ago, a new payment channel. Um, it's, it's very um, early to actually conclude the, the impact, but what we are seeing is that uh, typically the transactions and uh, involving luxury goods are moving pretty fast on that segment alone. And in that sense, we are seeing a higher take-up rate. So uh, we're going to launch another one in the next two, two to three weeks um, and another one in another five to six weeks. So the awareness is strong. Uh, customers are on board. And they, I think it's definitely going to help in a way to cushion the impact of COVID when it comes to the economic uh, part of it. Got it. Uh, and kind of staying uh, with, with you, if I may ask a follow-up question, there's one here about uh, shift from cash to online payment, uh, which I guess is something the sector has been trying now for many years. Um, how has that trend evolved this year? Cool. Uh, it's a great question, actually. Um, in all the markets in Southeast Asia, what we have realized is that uh, there has been some level of shift. While it wasn't drastic, but we've noticed about 2 to 3% share shift from a, a COD or offline channel to online channels. Uh, however, in contrary, in Philippines, because that question was a bit more specific to Philippine scenario, we noticed that uh, as we acquire new customers, the first choice for them is obviously COD in, in Philippines. Mm -hmm. I think this is attributed to also the points that was mentioned earlier. I can't remember by who, but uh, where the trust and the ability to, you know, experience it, experiencing the physical item before paying, uh, that perception or that kind of point of view still persists very strongly in Philippines. Um, but yeah, that's what we are, we are seeing at this point. Thank you, uh, Kanan. Um, let's change tracks a bit uh, and Tegar, I'll come to you for the next uh, question. We're seeing a few different questions on uh, just how to grow a marketplace, how to start, how does it evolve um, and what are the mistakes that uh, companies make? So let's start there with a question from Mio Vinzo. Um, what are the different growth phases of a startup marketplace platform player? Uh, and what are the key metrics and drivers uh, of each of the phases? Cool. I mean, wow, there are so many. Uh, I think it really depends on the marketplace that you're focusing on. Uh, obviously, growing uh, online retailing is different to in e-commerce. Uh, but like, if I could draw a similar pattern, uh, I think it's really important to understand first the underlying structure of supply and demand. And then secondly is focusing on the use cases uh, of the uh, marketplace itself as compared to optimizing for vanity metrics. So I'll go for the first one first. Uh, growing in a market like, let's say, tech retailing in Indonesia and Singapore. In Indonesia, the market is so blessed with so many supply. Uh, like we have so many bike drivers, millions of them. Uh, we have a lot of car drivers. So supply has never been really a problem in Indonesia. So in growing this kind of marketplace, it's really focusing on like how we could accumulate as much demand to the platform. And then like we could help build like this uh, field to a cycle. But obviously that's a different story in Singapore. Uh, car ownership in Singapore is the lowest uh, compared to any other country in the region. And car here is really expensive. So the market is so undersupplied. So uh, the strategy hence could be different. So like when we are tailoring the incentive to influence a certain behavior. Obviously in Indonesia, our capital spending would be a lot more on, let's say, vouchering, uh, like referrals and all of those to bring people into the platform on the demand side. But in Singapore, the incentive is more on the, let's say, supply side. So it's more like how we keep drivers on a platform and less so on the uh, customer side. 
Uh, and then the second one is about uh, building or more like focusing on the metrics that matter. So I think a lot of mistakes that we did was uh, focusing too much on like, let's say one month, two month detention, but we didn't really ask ourselves about like uh, for this particular use case, uh, what frequency uh, that makes sense. And I think this understanding evolves more uh, depending on the product. And as we uh, go along with the life cycle of the business, uh, let's say uh, we take like uh, the food business, right? I think uh, for food, I think uh, there is this obsession to kind of like always focusing on power user. Well, let's say we'll buy food uh, five, six times a week and only focusing on this customer. But like, hey, uh, there are some shallow use cases as well. Like let's say people buying bubble tea uh, once in a week or you know uh, once in a day and like we tend to not to focus on this like shallow use cases and they're just like hoping for everyone to be power users uh, which tend not to be the case so i think uh, looking at uh, uh, specific use cases that exist within uh, your product and then like uh, build the uh, strategy around them is what really matters as opposed to kind of like uh, pushing for that certain detention because like when uh, you push for the business to let's say hey you get a dead x retention for like two months what happened is people would rally to do anything to achieve that uh, you know retention number and sometimes that would mean like sending push notifications every day or like uh, sending a lot more vouchers than we needed to do so it, it ended up become a spam, you know, uh, and like people might not have these use cases daily. So it doesn't make sense to kind of like send them notification every day. Got it. Uh, that's, that, that's helpful, uh, Tegar, which is about just defining your strategy uh, based on the specifics of the market you're in. Uh, the question also uh, is about uh, growth phases for a start. Oh, do we lose Sarah? Yeah, I think so. Oh. Hello? So what? Well, yeah. Hey, you're back. Okay. Um, good. The wonders of technology. You never know what's <laughs> going on. Um, so I'm, I'm glad it's not more serious than this. Uh, Tegar, my question uh, was, I was following up on the original question, which said that what are the different growth phases? So. For a startup marketplace platform, is there a recipe that says in your year one, this is what you should do, years two to three, this is what you should focus on, phase three, phase four? Uh, can you break it down uh, or is it even possible to do that? Yeah, I think uh, it's very early to define what that phases would look like, as I think uh, mm -hmm. the marketplace itself has only been existing for like six, seven years now. So I think when we look back on how the progression so far from lunch until today. Uh, when we look at the first phase, which is like just building your marketplace, I think the focus should just be like acquisition, right? Uh, acquire as much supply as possible because like the growth of your marketplace is actually capped to your supply availability, right? And if uh, you are over demanded in a way, like when the demand is overpacing the supply, then you would have a certain conversion problem, right? Because there are this slew of unmet demands that couldn't be met by the marketplace. So I think in the first phase is about like uh, growing the supply base and then like growing the demand accordingly into that supply, ba uh, supply base. And obviously this process will cost a ton, right? And uh, growing marketplaces is uh, a lot of it is about cash burn as well. So like in this early phase is about cash burn and eventually this phase is, is growing as per expectation of how much margin can we generate from the business? So like yeah. when the marketplace is a bit mature, when the growth rates is not in the hundreds of percents, but it's more like in the double digits and you could kind of like uh, figure out which segments that you could, uh, let's say extract more profits from and which segments that you still wanna grow. And then uh, by uh, having this calculation to balance the supply and demand, you could end up like rationalizing some of the segments and not burn as much. And that's when you see that the marketplace is moving uh, from like a lot of cash burn to like 
reducing the cash burn bit by bit to eventually uh, having a positive margin. Got it. Um, on the point on cash burn, actually, this is a question which is mine. Um, uh, uh, would love to hear maybe, Joel, uh, your view. Uh, the industry is burning a lot of cash. Um, the, the commissions are very, very uh, low. Um, costs are high, uh, both for acquisition, reacquisition, operating, everything across the board. Um, what is the path back to profitability, do you think? It's a billion dollar question. Um, I think ultimately, if you're in a commoditized marketplace selling the same inventory as everybody else with the same logistics, then and ultimately there, there isn't a path, right? Uh, you're not going to get better by being the same as everyone else, right? So I think there's a significant need, uh, as Tegar said, to really understand your users, understand your use case, uh, and double and triple dip in particular segments that you can outserve, right? You're going to outserve them with depth of inventory. You might outserve them with logistics, the way that Amazon did once they launched Prime in 2004, right? To really outserve on predictability of, of what the good is going to look like, what kind of box is it going to come in, is it going to come on time? Uh, and they abandoned price, to be frank, at that same time, because they realized their buyers cared less about price than more about well, how the box process worked uh, and whether it arrived. Uh, other people are looking for liquidity, right? So as the supplier question we touched on with working capital and paying your suppliers very quickly, uh, if suppliers are happy, then, then they create inventory. They create long-tail inventory, and long-tail inventory attracts and sticks buyers to you. Uh, I think that's ultimately what any business comes down to is you've got to understand who your customer is uh, in a marketplace. You just have two constituents, right? You have the seller side and you have the buyer side and you have to outserve both of them in a way that makes them want to come back for more. Uh, shaving costs here and there is something you have to do, uh, but that's not the secret to profitability. The secret to profitability is owning a customer base and really outserving that customer base. Thank you. Um, so, you listed all the things that you could do right. Uh, there's a question here, which is what are the things you could do wrong? The question is uh, common mistakes that online companies tend to make. And maybe I'll put this question to Hardik. You, um, uh, what have you seen um, uh, the most common mistakes? Yeah, so I'll, I, also, I think while I answer that question, I'll also draw some of the hints from what uh, Joel said um, and, and what Tigard was also mentioning. See, I think one common mistake which marketplaces do is that they subsidize the wrong side of the marketplace, right? Uh, I think Tegar uh, briefly touched that topic that you have to really onboard the supply. Uh, whenever you're building a marketplace, there, there's a dynamics which are at play between the sellers and the buyers, right? You really need to understand which side of the market you need to uh, decrease the entry barrier for, right? For example, if I'm just, just thinking aloud, if I'm Gojek, or let's say I'm, I'm Food Panda, right? I have a very well-established food delivery business. I'm venturing into grocery delivery. I already have a customer base. I just have to subsidize the seller side. I just have to go and tie up with some leading convenience stores, some leading uh, supermarkets, and then that will get the ball rolling. Or if I am Zalora, I'm trying to enter, let's say, a new market altogether. I have no consumer base there. I have no seller base there. I, of course, I have to... Uh, monetize, I have, I have to start incentivizing both sides, right? So I think really identifying where your core strength is and how you're venturing into, uh, either are you expanding horizontally? Are you expanding vertically? That that needs to be taken care of. So, so really the first mistake is uh, subsidizing the wrong side of the market, uh, which becomes really expensive. Uh, second is, I think as, as Joel also mentioned, you need to stay ahead of the curve because if you do not have a differentiation with respect to your competitor, then pricing becomes a differentiation. If the same McDonald's is delivering food on two platforms, then of course, as a customer, the incentive is where I'm getting the discount, right? So really creating an ecosystem around your sellers or your buyers can really help you stay ahead of the curve. Constantly strive to create that competitive advantage. And I, I can draw so many examples from, from Food Panda, how we are achieving that. We started off as a food delivery company. Then on the seller side, we are offering them a self pickup service. We are offering them grocery deliveries, right? And, and we are just not stopping there. We, we are doing a bit of more things there. We are, we are launching membership programs. Then on the seller side, we are just not limiting our relationship with them being on platform and getting online sales. We are giving them credit. We are helping them. We're trying to help them with their restaurant supplies. 
right? So, so the second mistake is not innovating too soon, right? As, as a marketplace, you are eventually going to evolve again, either horizontally or vertically. And you need to really have a laser sharp focus, what you are trying to do, why you're trying to do so that you can stay ahead of the curve. Because once you're not, once that uh, the room of differentiation vanishes, then it becomes a pricing competition that leads to pricing war, which is so uh, from there, it's like a spiral down journey for, for any startup. Yeah. So I think these are broad themes. Uh, we can go into much detail, but I think this, this should, this should suffice. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, Hadi. I think this point on mistakes is, is so important. I've had so many discussions this year about how competitiveness in this sector is growing. And the perspective that um, that I, I quite like is actually it's a good thing because then you can learn from the mistakes of others and make sure you don't make the mistakes uh, yourself. Um, uh, let's uh, move on though. A few more questions for us to cover. I'll come to you, uh, Kanan. Uh, the question is about how does launching an online marketplace differ from launching an e-commerce website? And I'm sure um, you've um, also had many discussions in Zalora about uh, retailing versus being a marketplace uh, for other fashion brands. Um, what are the differences that you see? Right, so, so we, we started off as an e-commerce platform. Um, Zalora started off as an e-commerce platform and along the way we decided to also um, turn our model into a hybrid model where we will also have a good segment of uh, marketplace sellers. I think one of the realization, if I may, um, it's mainly to to realize that we will not be able to fulfill or offer everything that is available in the market. And beyond that, to also understand um, how marketplace could also help to position themselves to support the growth for Zalora in the sense of like keeping additional stocks, inventory access, and uh, also supply chain improvements. I think common, common pitfalls or looking into launching marketplace initially, I think, um, when, when launching marketplace, it's important to provide sufficient support to sellers because uh, some sellers could be really small and they do not have the understanding of e-commerce platform and how things generally work in terms of policies and in terms of uh, SOPs and in terms of, like to a granular neat detail as, uh, as in uh, packaging materials mm -hmm. and uh, packaging standards. So to that extent, Zalora provided support in the beginning. And then it also went on to... Uh, come to a point where it also needs some level of regulations. So regulation in terms of policies, if you do not fulfill within two days and we will have to cancel the order. So, and then what kind of penalty we put in place to ensure. Um, we also have an obligation towards our customers. So we need to have policies that are also helping or you know retaining the customers. So we have to make sure that the customer experience segue of the things are not being affected by this new model. Uh, so there are multiple policies governing the marketplace operations. So the sellers have to actually go through a, a, a course of time where they need to understand uh, and to some extent adhere to these processes before they can come on board. So th those are some of the things that we do on our front. Uh, thanks, um, uh, Kanan. And just one follow-up question to you as well. I'll pick this from Roy. Uh, what strategies can be employed to prove the value or benefit of a marketplace to the buyer side? Assuming small and medium business owners, you've talked about packaging and some of these services that um, uh, a platform can offer. Um, anything else you would like to add? Yeah, so I guess beyond uh, fulfillment uh, benefits, um, you know, we, we've actually gone to an extent of like also storing some of the products on how our warehouse doing fulfillment for them. Um, to some extent, it comes to a very minimal cost, but in a way, it, it's just being done as a, as a whole value proposition. I think beyond that, um, what Zalora offers is the ability of having multiple presence in multiple countries and be able to take your brand to a regional brand or to some extent to even a global brand. So I think we have introduced to some extent a uh, number of re uh, designers, local designers in Malaysia, and we brought them to to the likes of Singapore and Indonesia. And we also did the same for designers in Indonesia, we brought them to uh, Malaysia, Singapore. And at the same time, we also did, did the same for designers in Taiwan. I think beyond that, uh, we have also helped smaller merchants in some of these markets uh, where they have very niche segments and with good quality products. We have actually enabled an international routing for them. So a seller in Hong Kong would be able to now fulfill or list their items in a 
uh, platform that is based in Malaysia and also in uh, Indonesia. And then there's a supply chain around it where we actually enable the movement of goods. But, uh, thank you, uh, Kanan. Um, Tegar, I'll come to you for the next question. Um, and this one is uh, from uh, Janika Lau. With the rise of websites that allow food brands to have their own ordering websites and third party couriers, uh, how can Food Panda differentiate themselves? It's a question to Food Panda, but I'll make it broader, which is it is indeed true. If just not food, even for CPG, FMCG companies, there's this uh, discussion of how do we go direct to the consumer? Uh, so you have D2C business models competing with those of marketplaces. Um, how, so I, I guess there's so many questions here about what advice would you give a CPG or a brand or a food brand to go direct or through a marketplace? Um, or what advice would you give a marketplace, how they can differentiate themselves to encourage sellers to sell through them and not direct? Uh, you can pick either of these two questions that you like. Cool. Uh, I'll pick the small brands one going into the non-marketplace. Uh, I think this is definitely the trend that we've seen a lot in Indonesia. Uh, I mm. think as the uh, pandemic has been going through, uh, people lost their jobs. And then like uh, the first business that sprung to mind was, hey, I could start a food business or a catering business and sell that through WhatsApp or Instagram. And, uh, and we did a survey, uh, I think a, around three months ago in Indonesia, and then like saw that 75% of conversation that are going to WhatsApp are actually for businesses, uh, for the purpose mm. of actually selling this uh, food, goods and services. And these are actually people who are not well informed about how to go to the marketplace. And uh, it's not like they don't want to go to a marketplace, it's just like they don't know how. Uh, and these are especially people who are uh, not in the urban areas. So like uh, uh, mostly like uh, in the rural areas, uh, they're, they're just like really wanting to uh, expand their business. So uh, there's a product solution that we definitely tailor into this kind of markets like the long tail merchants. So uh, we are actually preparing how to make it easy uh, for this kind of small merchants to be uh, onboarded into the marketplace. Uh, you, you can think of it like a Shopify product, but uh, we make it easier and more localized. So I think uh, this trend will uh, kind of stay uh, for long, uh, despite the pandemic uh, this, uh, you know, uh, subsides. And uh, this is a trend that we see could grow very fast in the near future. So I would have uh, advised that uh, we should go with this trend and then like try to tailor the product needs because uh, I think it's here for long. Thank you. Uh, that's a very good answer for small businesses. Uh, what about big businesses? <laughs> How do marketplaces hold on uh, to big brands uh, that are selling through them and lose them to the brands trying to do uh, go direct to customer? Mm, I think it's uh, Kanan could probably best to answer this. Uh, I think in Gojek, uh, we don't necessarily partner with big businesses per se. Uh, in fact, uh, we do have like a third party platform where we help other startups to access uh, our uh, demand pool. And this, is, uh, this has been going for a year now and we've seen a lot of uh, successful integration. So I think earlier in the call, I mentioned about uh, the FinTech company uh, that sells gold. So like uh, uh, before joining Gojek, uh, I think uh, they're growing, but it wasn't that fast. And then like when they have access to Gojek uh, customer uh, through our platform, uh, uh, suddenly they have access to this like 40 million active users uh, who are thinking about uh, where to invest. So uh, we say this like with InsureTech, we partner with uh, uh, this app uh, for a gym membership. So I think partnering with Marketplace certainly give advantage because, uh, because of like this, just the sheer amount of demand that they have accumulated over the years. And then like this demand also uh, coming from a lot of consumer classes, right? Uh, uh, like the the high paying one, like the class A, class B customers. So uh, 
for big businesses, there is definitely a big uh, advantage if you want to be more data driven in tailoring your product so uh, to sell your product. I think marketplace is definitely a partner that can be relied on. Uh, thank you. And Kanan, since the question was tossed to you, is there anything yep, you'd sure. like to add? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, really picked my interest to answer it earlier. So, um, uh, what, what kind of angle I'm going to take is basically uh, you can never stop big brands from venturing into their own after, uh, you know, getting their head start into an e-commerce platform or marketplace platform. So at one point, they will definitely want to do, hey, let's try this on our own, right? So they will come to a realization at that point. Uh, but in a way, how we look at things is basically it, it is a partnership in essence. So for big brands with traditional approach to the market where, you know, offline retails, you know, they're typically around that, um, it has to be a big cultural shift that could take years. Uh, but I guess beyond that, what we try to understand is that how we as an e-commerce company, a pure play e-commerce company, are well positioned to help those companies to go online or even better to actually help them with the chain. So what we have done in Zalora is uh, whenever a merchant would like to start their brand.com website, we also help for them to hey, we can also keep your stocks. At the same time, we can help you to fulfill them. All you have to do is establish connection between your, our fulfillment center and your brand.com website. Uh, this would come at a minimal cost. It's a monetization opportunity as well. And then we will still be able to fulfill for you. At the same time, we will be able to fulfill that whatever comes through our platform. So typically try not to cut off the relationship straight away, but rather than keeping it at the same time, making sure that we enlarge our offerings. So that's how we have been doing it so far. And I think uh, one, other, one other opportunity that this uh, gives is uh, the access to inventories in that sense, where we actually store them on our fulfillment centers. It also gives us an access to our inventories without actually paying for it or owning them. Um, thank you. Um... I think we've, we've got three minutes left, folks, so we have to draw this to the close. For folk, for others who asked questions we couldn't get to, um, uh, sorry, but I, I'm, I'm sure uh, Therapy in Asia will uh, be happy to, to follow up uh, on these as well. Uh, in closing, though, I'd like to go around and uh, pose a question to all of you. And the question is the following. Uh, number one, when do you think uh, we will be, uh, the world will be back to normal? Uh, and number two, what will that uh, new normal look like uh, from an e-commerce marketplace perspective? Uh, Hardik? Yeah, I think before Joel mentioned it's a billion dollar question, I think this is a trillion dollar question <laughs> because this, this impacts like the whole world across. I think we are seeing some good news, right? Regarding the vaccines being tested by Pfizer having 90% efficiency but again i'm i'm really really not sure when that's going to be made publicly available because there's a it's, it's a logistically nightmare to to have that spread across the world uh, deliver that across the world because it has to be kept at a temperature which is quite low uh, i don't think we have that sophisticated cold chain yeah. uh, distribution right so so that that's a separate topic but i so so again, this question is emotional. I can give an emotional answer. I wish um, a short, I mean, I, a, a, a short emotional answer. That's what we need. Yeah, I think by quarter two next year, things should be back okay. on track, right? And what does that new normal look like? I think it is not going to be very different from what it is today, uh, especially when we see countries. I think we can take some hints from countries like Taiwan, where food band operates, Japan, South Korea. And what we've seen there is that they're absolutely, the COVID cases are pretty much under control. Uh, the community spread has been controlled, but still the, the volumes of e-commerce, which they really observed in the past are still here, right? The, the, the new modus operandi is still here. So I think even in the new normal, things are not going to be much different from what it is today. Thank you. Uh, Joel? Uh, I think, yeah, middle of next year sounds close to right, so probably early third quarter. Um, I think the, the biggest change that we're ultimately going to see in aggregate uh, is you know, massively connected workforce, massively connected population, because clearly we're all doing this uh, or we're doing this in schools. Uh, and we're going from a world of a lot of digital amateurs to a lot of digital experts. So I don't think there's a, a likelihood that we're going to go back to the mixed shift between mm -hmm. online and offline that we had before. 
uh, no matter what, the mix is going to shift dramatically forward and people are going to be looking for hybrid online services in almost everything that they do uh, with much higher standards, right? Because we have so many more entrants to the market, so much more volume and users going to platform companies trying to facilitate it. And I think we've easily got two more generations of user experience and technology in just the next six months uh, of expertise and training going out to the population. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Kanan. Yep, sure. Um, just to echo Joel and um, uh, Habrik, uh, so basically I think uh, next year, summer in the middle looks per perfectly fine, uh, provided the vaccine have reached uh, the countries. So uh, the new norm for me, I think uh, pretty much is going to revolve around um, convenience. So the expectation of customers is going to be really, really high. Uh, given um, how e-commerce has been propositioned to them and uh, served to them in a way that, okay, this is going to be a new norm. This is going to be very convenient. So in that sense, customers' expectations are going to be very high. Uh, there will be a lot of personalization-based uh, requests uh, trying to understand uh, how we need to do deliveries faster, how we make uh, payments more convenient. And uh, so these are, I guess, new norms for industries to adapt. Thank you, Kanan. Uh, finally, Tegar. Not a calculation, more of a hope. Uh, I hope, yeah, by mid year next year. <laughs> I think we've been through enough. Uh, in terms of like the digital mix, I do expect uh, it will be lower uh, as we recover, but it would still be a higher compared to pre 2020. Very clear. Um, thanks, folks. That was a fascinating conversation. I certainly learned a lot. Uh, let's uh, keep this going in our other circles, uh, wherever we are. Uh, Paul, back to you. Thank you very much, Sarab, and thank you to all of our panelists, Hardik, Tigar, Joel, and uh, Kanan as well. Um, definitely a really interesting discussion, and I think we could probably have gone on for another hour or two very easily, but, you know, the idea is just to give you guys a, a snapshot of this and then hopefully kickstart some of the conversations. So, um, I'm sorry to those of you whose questions we didn't manage to answer during the session. Um, thank you for being very participatory and trying to get your questions answered. It's really great. It always makes it much more fun for the panelists as well. Um, if you would like to get in touch with any of our speakers, um, they are all on LinkedIn. So I'm sure they'd be delighted to connect with you there and continue the discussion. Um, otherwise, just from, <coughs> on behalf of myself um, and the team here at Seamless Asia, thank you very much for joining us and do watch out for an email tomorrow when we will um, forward you the link to access the session on demand. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.